So good afternoon, September the 29th, 2014. This is CISG 114, Section 1, to Web Technology and Live. Today is day number 11 into week number 6. So let us get started. Good afternoon, welcome back. And uh, this is day number 11 of this course. Well, if you have paid attention to the class messages, I have given you a new message this morning. This is the teacher's message for week number 6. If you look at this teacher's message for week number 6, you understand that I have tried to remind you of the art that you need to produce at the end of your second learning contract, which is the end next week. This is already the middle of the second week. So if you look at the number of items here, it's very much the same as the first learning contract, except for the fact that in this learning contract, you, as a member of your peer, and also as a member of your team, need to get involved with the use of Wiki in the Moodle environment to tie up the report together. And this is very important. We're going to produce a Microsoft Word document of this report. It's a team report. This team report requires two topics, one from each pair of your team. So if you have not given me your team compositions and donations, make sure you give this to me by writing in Dr. Vance's Q&A hotline for this week, okay? So <coughs> another thing you need to pay attention to is the choice that I've given you, all right? So how are you going to make your choices? Well, in this second learning contract, you are reminded of the second time in this week that you have to select two course independent learning outcomes from the 6th of April and not more than three. So once you've chosen the two course independent learning outcomes, the best way is for each pair to be responsible for one specific course independent learning outcome. In that case, you can start choosing the topic questions which is available in each year's reading list. Now, if you do not, if you do not uh, have the silo ready, it might be that once you choose a question for the reading list, you have to do many things all over again because you want to do something which is consistent with your assignment. Alright? So if you do not do the silo first, you have to choose it the other way around. And you know what I'm trying to tell you. You do not want to waste your time and do extra things for something which you can do it by half of the time you did. So remember, a choice here for each pair. <coughs> oh, by the way, um, the discussion forum detail. Now, how are you going to get started? Because you're four persons in your team. Well, the best way to start is just like in your first learning contract. The two of you in your pair start by hosting one question on your own interest in your peer discussion forum, and then you post your set of OIA, and then through a period of not more than three days, the two of you in your pair champion one topic from the two available. And that topic, that champions, become the topic that will be included in the team discussions. So when you copy your peer discussion detail for that topic, you have this much the topic in the peer discussion forum. But the same topic, if it happens to be chosen in the team discussion forum, that means in a team discussion forum, which you will have it by the beginning of next week, you still have another set of discussion topic with not only your peer partner, but your teammates, two more persons. So understand the importance here. It's very important that I remind you this, and again, well, check the rubrics before you submit anything because the rubric will definitely give you ideas of the score you're going to obtain. Now, having said all of these, this is not the first time I remind you, but in black and white, in the teacher's message this week, you know that this is the set of artifact you need to produce based on two silos selected from the course in Hanabelli outcome and based on the work you have to do with your team members. So it's very important that you produce a team composition and you know who you are working with. Now all of these are based on the ideas of constructivist learning. Okay? Well, constructivist learning requires you to put things in perspective. And so in a discussion forum, in the second learning contract, 
quite different from the First Amendment contract. I give you some guidelines. Guidelines of evidence, evaluations of evidence, guidelines on analysis and synthesis of the evidence. Because when you handle a specific topic, you need to look at information. And the way you look at information, you look into questions like this. It helped you sharpen your mind to present evidence in a way which is of quality, inquiry-based learning. So one, two, three, four sets of questions study from the evaluations of evidence, analysis and synthesis of evidence, to drawing up to conclusions, finally acknowledge that yours may not be the only options, okay? Many things that could be possible. So the constructive is great of learning something requires of you that you are getting involved with a new idea introduced by your higher care partner or introduced through your reading, and you need to get to know more about this idea. Just write it out for yourself, get some experience and feedback from your learning partner and also from the teammate, and finally do the rethink, reflect, adjust, and try again. This is the rock, this is the discussion, this is an online observation, note taking, and this is the encounter. Okay, so how are you getting to know more of this? Now, the, the process of getting yourself being familiar with this so-called five-step process of constructivist learning, it's often summarized by an article produced by John Gray in 1999 and said, what the student does is very important if we want to teach them for enhanced learning. So, Today, we are going to come back after our first class lessons to give you a chance to look at these three episodes of award-winning soft movies, which was produced in recognition of John Dick's contributions in the field of education to enhance student learning. Now, having said that, allow me to go back here to week number six, Okay, week number six, remember, we're supposed to two days this week, but the second day happens to be a holiday. So, we invite you to do it on your own, or watching the video, but the school is very high enough. I noticed that um, the original day uh, for the end of the semester is November the 29th or something, but we are going to give you back those lost days due to holiday. So the make up class with this course will be extended for two other days in the first week of December. So don't worry much about it. You will be given back the time. Now, let us get back to the topic of this week, okay? Actually, if you look at the topic of this week, it's topic two, which was once discussed last week, but we're going to revisit it this week, and then topic three, the mashups and virtual office applications. So I'm going to help you understand something very fundamental first. What is World Wide Web? Okay, how do you make of it? Now, so let us try a very review video to help you put things into perspective. Have you ever wondered, when you visit a website, where those words and images come from? This is the World Wide Web in plain English. These days, as long as we have an internet connection, using the web is pretty easy. We can visit billions of pages on things from pet alligators to the weather in Holland. To help figure out how it works, let's pretend we can get really small, follow the wires, and explore what makes the web work. In order to get to the web, we need a connection from our home or business to the rest of the online world. This usually happens through the phone or cable lines, or even satellite. This connection means that information from around the world can reach our computers. If we could see the connection, the information coming through it would look like little packets of code. It doesn't make sense to most people. We need a translator something that turns the packets of code into words and images we see on a website. For this, we use a web browser. 
It translates the information and makes it useful to us. But that code has to come from somewhere, right? If we could follow it to its home, we'd see that it's coming from another computer. Not a regular computer, but one that's built to make web pages available. It's called a server. The words and images that appear on our screen live here in the server. If there was only one server, this would be simple. But there are millions of servers and web pages. We need a way to find a specific page on a specific server. We do this with web addresses. Each server and website has a unique one. As long as we have the right web address, we can visit a page on any server on the web. The reason we call it a web is that all the servers are connected. We can easily jump from one to the other using addresses via our web browser. And we don't have to remember all the addresses. Web pages use shortcuts or links, words and images we can click that direct us to page after page. These links create a web of connections that are easy to navigate. Together, this system makes up the World Wide Web. So, let's sum it up. To visit a website, we type in a web address or click a link. The information for the website lives on a server. It comes to us as little packets of code, and our web browser translates this code into words, photos, music, videos, and links that help us get things done. Yay! I'm Lee LaFever, and this has been the World Wide Web in Plain English. So I hope this for more detailed resources and videos about technology, security, mobility, and marketing, visit CenturyLink.com slash SMB dash resources. So having watched this review video on what is meant by World Wide Web, I hope you understand some of the mechanics behind it. Although it's not very detailed, but the idea is already there. And when someone asks you the meaning of the World Wide Web, at least you understand how to interpret the web address, the computer which provides the web pages, is the web server, and transmissions and how things are being transmitted across the net. Now, in order to help to get into perspective something that is much more um, conceptual, I would like to provide you with this Web 3.0 video, okay? But this may not be the best one. Right? In fact, this is the promotional video of a specific company. But in the process of listening to this video, you will see the distinction between the Web 1.0, Web 2.0, and the emerging Web 3.0. So let's go for it. Being aware of the numerous advancements in technology is not an easy task. But fortunately, during the next few minutes, you will obtain crucial information on one of the biggest upcoming revolutions, the Web 3.0, as well as great tips on how to be aware of the newest upcoming technology. But what does all this web nonsense have to do with me, you might ask yourself? Well, you would actually be surprised. Just take a look around. You'll be able to find a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone beside you, or even all of them. Just tell me, what will you do if all your Facebook information gets lost? Or if somebody steals your email password? I would go crazy! Currently, information is not just a bunch of bits anymore. It's actually becoming an extension of ourselves. So, what is the Web 3.0? The Web 3.0 is the upcoming web revolution. The semantic web. A personalizable place with intelligent search and behavioral advertisements where content is generated by machines rather than by humans where virtual items or information become more valuable than physical items, where we'll get a tweet telling us if our boss is on time, or even if our food is going out of date in the fridge. Yeah. Oh, does that mean that the web has been evolving? Exactly. Remember many years ago, when Google just launched, YouTube was just coming out, and MSN Messenger used to be the thing. <laughs> oh yeah, I totally forgot about that. Well, those were part of the first web generation, or Web 1.0. The web then began to evolve into a much more dynamic web. Technologies like RSS, HX, and XML started coming up. Content management systems were replaced by widgets. Blogs became more common than diaries, and social media became an essential tool for every single individual, creating what we now know as the Web 2.0. Currently, innovative technologies like the Google Glass project, augmented reality, 
and advanced mobile technologies are what makes this third generation of web possible. Wow, where can I get this web 3.0? You actually interact with several web 3.0 technologies every day. Smartphones, for example, are one of the biggest factors in this revolution. Incredible 4G speeds, retina displays, and technologies like cloud computing improve the web experience massively. Studies have even shown that people are tending towards using their smartphone or tablet more than their actual computers. We can even see this revolution in computers. Take Windows 8, for example, which is trying very hard to adapt to the tablet market. Web 3.0 also allows a thing we call hyperconnectivity. What this really means is that everything is starting to be interconnected through the internet. There are already twice as many devices connected to the internet than people in the world. And it is set to increase to 6.5 per person by 2020. That sounds amazing. Hey, and can my business benefit from all this? Definitely. Businesses benefit from the Web 3.0 in numerous ways. They're not only discovering new novel ways of using social media for marketing, but they're making use of technologies such as Ruby Rails, Python's Django, and Hadoop to scale their businesses massively through the internet by selling software as services instead of as products. So what you're saying is that the Web 3.0 is perfect? As you might know, nothing can be perfect. With many new technologies coming up, powerful malware and harmful software comes along. The web is advancing so fast that some security protocols are not catching up, leaving loopholes which hackers can then exploit. Also, with the massive increase of value in virtual information, there is also an increasing concern as its protection becomes much more crucial for everyone. All this is great, but how can I keep myself aware of the latest upcoming technology once this video is over? Don't worry, there are numerous ways to achieve this. Feel free to visit our site at web3.hackasatan.com where you will find more information on the web 3.0 as well as its technologies, its influence in mobile systems, business and security as well as very useful links to tech news, blogs, and videos. Thank you very much for your time and wish you an amazing day. I hope you can use this video as the basis to help you understand the differences between Web 1.0 and Web 2.0 and then between Web 2.0 and Web 3.0 and then the question is through this two very soft video, we should have some basic understanding of what is meant by a World Wide Web. How has the World Wide Web evolved from the very beginning? Well, for me, it's 1994. That is the beginning of the web story, and I call this is the birth year of Web 1.0. And the web, when it's stepped to 204, almost 10 years later, is the beginning of the Web 2.0 era. Now, it's 20. In another 10 years, we are stepping into Web 3.0. Now, ask yourself this question What have you learned in this video that would distinguish Web 3.0 from Web 2.0? What are supposed to be in the Web 3.0 that is not so visible in Web 2.0? Of course, in Web 1.0, you see there's just one way it's from the screen to you is information. You do not interact with it. Web 2.0 is something like raw, wiki, and other tools you actually can generate the content. Hopes it or not, we become an information generator rather than an information consumer. Now, what is all about Web 3.0? Sometimes, Web 3.0, people would call it is a semantic web. Semantic web means it's a web with meaning. Meaning is involved in means intelligence. Web 3.0 is Web 2.0 with human intelligence. Well, human intelligence absolutely not definitely possible. So they call it the amplifications of intelligence and some kind of intelligence there. How do I know? Well, today, when you try to answer the question, for example, how far is China from east to west? How, how, how long? Okay, so what is the distance between the, the far west point and the far east point of China? 
If I have questions like this, how are you going to answer them yourself? Today, I type the question into Google. And then we got a bunch of results. Well, compared to the Google search engine in the Web 3.0 era, applications would actually help you answer, pinpoint the answer to questions like this and provide you a bunch of very specific data. Well, another example is I moved to Macau. I want to eat uh, Portuguese food in Macau. So I type in where is the best Portuguese food restaurant. What do you expect to get when you type something in like this in the Google? Well, in the context of Web 3.0, people will ask you, do you like Portuguese food from Macau or Portuguese food from Portugal? Or do you want Portuguese food as a family? Or do you want Portuguese food as a big buffet? Well, intelligence tells us that if we can add things like this and we narrow the scope, we do not have hundreds of pages for us to go through. This is one example. Another example of what 3.0 is here is because of the mobile devices. Look, look around the table. Each one of you has a smartphone. The smartphone is a mobility device which adds a lot into the web. Okay? So these two important video helps you put things into perspective. Yet could you tell me the differences between the intellect and the world of the web? What's the difference between the intellect and the world wide web? All right, so let us try to see if we can answer this questions by going through one more thing. Let's say, how does the intellect world work? When you use the internet, what happens? Whether you go online to chat with a friend, or send mail, or buy a book, or check the weather, watch a movie, or study the Peloponnesian War, it feels like there's one wire connecting you directly to the thing you want. But a billion other people are connecting to a billion other things at the same time. How does that happen? It's really about making agreements. Think of networking as a game. It only works if we agree to play by the same rules. Otherwise, it's not much fun. If you can get two or more computers to play together, you have a network. If your friend can do it too, there's another network. But if you both agree that your networks will play the same way, now you can hook the two together. You have an internet work. The rules we play by are called the internet protocol. And as long as we all agree, we can keep adding more devices and more networks until the whole world is connected. That's what the internet is. A network of networks that share each other. device on the internet has its own unique address. Anything you send via internet is really just a message from one device to another. But it doesn't travel in one big block. It gets pulverized into tiny packets of data, each one wrapped with info about what it is, where it came from, and where it's going. This way, your one message can actually take several different paths to its destination. Then, by following the protocol, the receiving device knows how to put it all back together. The strength of the internet is that it's decentralized. With so many possible connections, there is no single point of failure. If one path gets overloaded or broken, your data just takes a different path. Even if a big chunk of the internet gets wiped out, your message can still find its way. But let's say you use one internet provider and your friend is on a different one. How does your data really get from one network to the other? Some companies make private connections with each other to exchange traffic. But 
more and more traffic is flowing through shared service platforms we call internet exchange points. An internet exchange is a place where many different organizations come together to interconnect their technology. There may be access providers, broadcasters, publishers, social network sites, telecom operators. Nearly anybody who relies on network traffic can benefit from the exchange. By connecting in a common place, they save costs, and the traffic between them flows faster and much more efficiently. Traditionally, providers have sold each other passage on their networks. But for some providers who regularly exchange traffic, all that buying and selling can get to be more trouble than it's worth. Many of them saw that if they just agreed to meet each other halfway, then everybody's costs go down and the traffic moves more smoothly. Providers are able to make a single connection to the platform to exchange traffic with many participants. This way of doing things is called peering, and it's making the internet faster and more affordable for everybody. The exchange participants make deals with each other according to mutual benefit, so the peering system tends to regulate itself. It may seem like companies are giving away their services, but in fact, each is providing their part of the whole solution their customers need to most efficiently and reliably exchange traffic. The internet is open, decentralized, and totally neutral. Its intelligence lives at the edge, not in the core. No single organization controls it, and that's why it works as well as it does. By agreeing to cooperate, we all make the internet happen. And that's how the internet happens. Okay, now you've got some ideas about how the internet works together. Can you come back to the questions? What are the differences between the internet and the world wide web? Or may I pose this question as about the following?
you're free to talk at this point. Talk to your member. I'll let you talk about it. Okay? Let me take attendance from you. So, Eva, thank you. Uh, Priscilla, Priscilla. Okay. Uh, Daxa, yes, right here. And then Ken, yes, over there. Jackie. Got some responses already. See how the intellect is not equivalent to the intellect. It's not equivalent to the world by that, right? Okay? It's just one of the services which the intellect has to offer. It's one against an intellect service. Okay. That's very good. That means the the intellect seems to be an infrastructure. The world wide web seems like to be a service. This is a very good concept, a conception. Let's say we'll get all in a minute.
specific questions. What do you think of the differences between the intellect and the World Wide Web? And also, what do you think of the differences between Web 1.0, Web 2.0, Web 3.0? Okay. So, let's see. Let me give you the first answer. Mysteries of the Internet. You likely use the Internet for browsing the web, sending email, or playing online games. But have you ever wondered what the Internet actually is? The Internet is essentially a vast number of different computers and networks around the world. Every computer connected to the Internet has a unique address, similar to your home's postal address. The Internet ensures information flowing between different addresses reaches its destination as quickly as possible. Internet addresses are a series of numbers rather than the typical website names such as www.ydea.com that you're accustomed to typing into a web browser. However, the Internet has a built-in mechanism for translating every website name into its exact address, called an IP address. Your computer isn't likely connected directly to the Internet, even if you have a broadband connection at home. Basically, all of your internet traffic, such as instant messaging or web browsing, must be translated into a format that can travel to your local broadband provider over telephone, cable, or other types of lines. Your broadband provider likely has multiple high-speed connections that connect it to the internet. Now let's put the pieces together. Suppose you open up a web browser on your home computer and type in a particular website's name. Your computer first locates its exact address on the internet and then sends information out of your home over your broadband connection, bound for the website's address. When a website responds, it sends data back over the internet to your computer. Amazingly enough, this process usually takes place in under a second, even when a web server is located thousands of miles away. For more information on this topic and many others, please visit www.wydea.com. You see the link in about a minute and a half, all right? So this is a very good exercise. So what about the, um, the distinctions from Web 1.0, 2.0, 3.0? Let's go for it. The internet is very much alive and kicking. 
the first generation of internet sites primarily gave information. But with the rise of sites like Facebook and Amazon, the web has become increasingly interactive. On this web 2.0, it's mostly the user who produces the content. Without contributors, there would be no Facebook, and without people who post information on Wikipedia and their clips on YouTube, there would be no interaction on these sites. Meanwhile, most people have become familiar with Web 2.0. Blogging, tagging, social networking and social bookmarking have paved the way to a next step in the development of the web. The step to the intelligent and omnipresent Web 3.0. Web 3.0 is not totally different from the web we know now. It is in many respects a continuation of existing techniques. Think of the so-called recommender systems that make a personal approach on your website possible. Amazon has cleverly used this system for a long time now by offering their clients products that other people with the same interest bought before them. And on Last FM, you can listen online to music that caters to your personal wishes. By using smart systems, these sites are in a continuous learning process and they anticipate what their users like or dislike. Important for sites like Last FM or Amazon is that a song or a book gets extra information added by the user. No sudden change of the internet, it changes gradually. What does change quickly is the look and feel of the web. Simply speaking, the internet is a web full of appliances that communicate with each other by exchanging information. As more and more everyday appliances are connected to the internet, think of telephones, washing machines and cars, the web is more present, but it will become less and less visible. No big separate computer, but invisibly present in everyday appliances. When, moreover, all these appliances start communicating with each other through the internet, this may lead to useful additional services measured to meet our individual needs. For the time being, we are not yet dealing with an all-knowing, omniscient computer which comes close to or even surpasses human intelligence. Writing computer programs which, in a human manner, convert data into useful information also known as the semantic web, appears quite difficult. But the web undoubtedly evolves into an environment which is intelligent and which will meet our wishes more often, more easily and automatically. New services develop because data from various sources can be linked more easily. Moreover, with the good and often wireless infrastructure, these new internet services are always and everywhere available. Your online agenda becomes a personal assistant which, all by itself, for instance on the basis of your profile on LinkedIn, Facebook or other information, will check your possibilities for new appointments and even take travelling times into account. Your destination and itinerary too will have been sorted out by links between restaurant sites, GPS information and local weather services. EPN, the Dutch think tank on the impact of information technology, approaches Web 3.0 from various points of view and draws attention to its implications for society. Well, you know that this video was produced by EPN, the European Research Institute. Okay, now, uh, with this four set, with this set of four important videos, I hope you have a better understanding of where we come so when we talk about web technology and life then today, um, compared to one month ago, you should have a better picture of what it's meant by this web, okay? So, now, let me go back to see if you have done some good things here. Wow, it's very good. You've got something more. So tell me, I think the internet, it's the large container, very interesting, and the web is Okay, micro intellect is a tool to connect the world network and world wide web is a kind of media dissemination of information. So, internet that's also a very good way to, to put things in perspective. 
Harry. In Telang, it's a massive network. Network, very good, very accurate. Network infrastructure, very good. It connects millions of computers together globally. The World Wide Web, or simply web, is a way of assessing information over the media. That is a very good one. Very technical, very precise. It's an information sharing model. Oh, very good term. This is a very good term. It's built on top of the internet. So, very good. So, Eric's work is very good. And what about Christina? The intellect, it's a complex structure. Yes, it's very complex, including telephone, cable, satellite, and cable compositions, which the next computers around the world. World Wide Web is a global resource, so we can use collectively the positioning system on the internet and take part in. Well, it's very interesting. This is the first time we I see some of you use this term to describe the web. Not that people who say it's a tool, okay? And it now is considered as a resource. But you can say that tool is also a resource. Okay, yeah? Uh, so it says, guys, the intellect is a global system of interconnected computer networks. It's very good. It networks exchange information. This is a very good term. And the World Wide Web is interlinked with data and it's my intellect. This is very good. When you use the word exchange, it's a very important term that it has uh, multiple dimensions. Now, uh, uh, the reason why I keep doing this, put something on the forum, collect your ideas, is because I give you some time to think about what you're learning, and, and also give some time to put it in perspective. How, how would we learning can impact our life? Now, before I introduce to you the teacher's message, uh, John Vick's free uh, movie episodes. I really want you to pay attention when you are at home, okay? Because today time is not enough. Go back to the um, to the videos on during class activities of last week, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, watch this particular video at home. Student centered learning, 21st century education. This is very important. Actually, I want to use it as the basis to summarize my lectures today, but time is one now. I need to give a cap of time. And so, watch this episode of okay, trying to put things into perspective. In the meantime, I will now pay to, to soldier this teacher's message today. Okay, week number six. Um, I'm going into this part. Now, I would like to put things into perspective. Um, Today, this week, and actually also next week, actually the three weeks in the second learning contract. If you ask me to summarize your SRL experience compared to the inquiry based experience in the first learning contract, the first learning contract will use active versus passive learning. But in the second learning contract, it's deep versus surface learning. Okay? Um, be it active versus passive learning or be it deep versus service learning, mostly it is an individual choice, okay? I cannot, as a teacher, force you to do one way rather than the next another way, but as a student, you understand it after you watch the video. I'm going to ask you to choose or to tell, maybe you're playing partner, when you're going to be a dealer, when you're going to be a service learner, okay? So let's get something out of here.
meet Susan. Susan is a 23-year-old computer science student at the university. Today she has a semantics lecture which she is really excited about. Susan likes to get to the bottom of things, to reach understanding. She often reflects on possibilities, implications, applications, the consequences of what she's learning. Susan is characterized by a preference for deep learning. She spontaneously uses higher cognitive processes. Faced with the curriculum, she basically teaches herself. In fact, we almost cannot prevent her from learning. But she is not our concern today. Robert, on the other hand, is. Now, where is Robert? Ah, there he is. Robert is also a homo sapiens. Same age, also a student of computer science, and also has the semantics lecture today. However, Robert is a different type of student. His goal is not to achieve understanding. In fact, Robert doesn't really care about the learning in itself. His goal at university is different. His goal is to get a piece of paper and a handshake from an important man who's right here, to pass exams, get a degree, and get a decent job. by a preference for surface learning. He will only use higher cognitive processes if he really, really, really has to. He will cut any corner in achieving his goal with minimum effort. So I'm sure you can all see the nuclear structure of the finite automaton easily interpreted as a transition system where the configuration is simply the states of the automaton. Let's have a look inside the auditorium to see how Susan and Robert are doing. Let's look a little closer. This is interesting. The bicycle relation between the two concurrent systems is a relation of the states satisfying that equation to the next states. If one system has a form of reaction, now let's have a look at Robert. In such a way that the two systems end up what is breaking. And we say the two systems are quite similar if and only if there exists a bisimulation between the two systems. I'll just give you one example. If you think of a problem. Here you might think that Robert is the only one to blame. That he's the only one responsible for his mediocre gain from the teaching. But Robert just has a different goal than Susan. He's merely responding to a system. The statistics also carry an important message and suggest a different course of action. 20 or 30 years ago, there were mostly Susans at the universities. Nowadays, however, as student intake has increased dramatically, the Roberts now outnumber the Susans. This makes for a considerable problem which is important to tackle for any responsible modern society. But before we deal with it, Robert's learning that is, we need to take a look at the situation from a different perspective. Let's see what the teachers have to say about our two students. Yes? Excuse me, could you tell me about Susan, please? A Susan, yes, Susan is one of our good students. She always does well, not only in my own classes, but I know that she performs well in all classes. She's truly one of our good students. Then, what about Robert? Robert, Robert. You know, the guy. Ah, Robert. Well, he's one of our best students. Notice how this labeling conveniently defers responsibility. In particular, we cannot do anything about it. 
It's just the way students are. Either good or bad. This good student, bad student perspective is also known as the blame the student's approach to teaching and is level one in John Bibb's three levels of thinking about teaching. A level one teacher is concerned with what students are. For him, the exam is a matter of sorting the good students from the bad. A level two teacher has the focus on the teacher and is concerned with what the teacher does. From this perspective, there are good teachers. I think I had an animation yesterday, and uh, you'll see the information in blue. And bad teachers. For the proof of lemma 37b, assuming that proposition 21g holds. This perspective is also known as the blame the teacher's perspective. A so-called good level two teacher will attempt to arm himself with an armada of teaching techniques, tips, and tricks. There are many types of level two teachers. However, common for most of these, apart from having a teacher focus, is that the result is passive students. We need to engage and activate the students. And then she said. It was the transition system. <laughs> Great teacher. Man, that guy was good. Yeah, but I didn't really get the point about the indexes. And I wasn't too sure about the rest of Ireland, but uh, yeah, great teacher. It's clearly demonstrated by our entertainer teacher. Activation itself is not enough. A teacher at the most advanced level, level three, is particularly concerned with what a student does before, during, and after teaching. That is, he is particularly concerned with the product or the learning outcome of the teaching. But before we can go there, we need to understand understanding. Okay, now comes the video. You were introduced to one way to look at education and brought in, in the context of student learning. And um, two personas, one the Robin, the other is the Susan. And in the video, Robin is described as a service learner. His interest is not to understand something. His interest is in the credentials at the end of the process of education. So he could use the credentials to find a good job. But Susan is a person who is described as a deep learner who always gets to the bottom of things, trying to learn something by fulfilling his own intrinsic motives. And then, we went on. In the process of learning here, teachers are often used a very simple laboring system that if you can fulfill my requirement, doing good in my tests, or whatever it is, I will label you as good. If you cannot do it, you will label as bad. Okay, this is called a brain the student approach. And then sometimes, when students are not satisfied with what the teacher does, they will also put the brain on the teacher and say, this is a good teacher, this is a bad teacher. Um, observations of the way teachers conduct his teachings. And then, John Brick introduces it. Besides what the student are, which is called a brain the student, and what the teacher do, this is called brain the teacher approach, there is a third approach, which is called what the student does. So what is all about what the student does? The video ends there, it tells us something about a learning perspective, and it ends there, and what are we going to do? Okay, here we go. Since we were talking about activation, I'd like to activate you, the viewer, using the following puzzle. Please consider the following numeric transcription system, where one is written like this, two like this, 
and so forth. I'll give you 10 seconds. Now I'd like you to write down, say the last five digits of my office phone number. 18725 in this numeric system. We, Homo sapiens, are quite bad at memorizing random information. Psychologists claim that we are only able to hold seven plus minus two pieces of random information in our short-term memory. Now, suppose I showed you the following grid. As you can see in this number system, one is at the top left corner, and hence written like this, whereas, for example, eight is at the bottom, and hence written like this. Now you can probably write anything using this silly number system for the next 65 years. The point is that we as humans learn by associating new and unknown information with old and known information, or that we build new information on top of old information. In this case, it was easy. We simply exploited that you all knew a certain geometric shape, the grid symbol, and the numeric layout of a conventional telephone. But when teaching semantics or fertilization or political power theory or Roman literature, it may not be clear what the students know or how they know it. The point is that knowledge is constructed as a result of the learner's activity. This is in sharp contrast to the old now abandoned idea that knowledge is transmitted from a teacher to a passive learner. Transmission is not the way humans learn. Active knowledge construction is. Learning takes place through the active behavior of the student. It is what he does that he learns, not what the teacher does. However, activation itself is not enough. We also need a theory of understanding to take into consideration how students are activated. Professor John Diggs has such a theory. The solo taxonomy, short for structure of the observed learning outcome, distinguishes five levels according to the cognitive processes required to obtain them. The lowest level of the taxonomy, level one, is known as the pre-structural level, at which the student has no understanding, uses irrelevant information, and or misses the point altogether. One final question, what is a cow? Level two is known as the unistructural level, where a student will focus on one relevant aspect only. Here the student has the confidence to identify, to do a procedure, and or to recite. A cow is when you're milking. A student at the multi-structural level, level three, can focus on several relevant aspects, but they are considered independently. He is able to classify, to combine, to enumerate, and so on. Cows give us milk, and when slaughtered, they give us oil, meat, fats, bone, and leather. At level four, which is called the relational level, a student can now link and integrate several parts into a coherent whole. Details are linked to conclusion, and this meaning is understood. He has the ability to relate, to compare, to analyze, and so on. The essential difference between a Jersey cow and a Herford Angus cow is that a Jersey cow produces a lot more milk, but is substantially smaller. At the fifth and highest level, the extended abstract level, a student has the capacity to generalize the structure beyond the information given, and even produce new hypotheses or theories which may then be scrutinized. 
Cattle or kai are domesticated ungulates, a member of the subfamily Bovine. And it seems to me that humans must have been the root cause for the diversification of cattle because they were selected for different genetic characteristics like trout, milk, meat, size, color, and behavior to name a few. We refer to levels 4 and 5 as deep understanding. This one can prove that it is always a pure inspiration of cattle. Excuse me, isn't this the same as last week except for Levels 2 and 3 are referred to as surface understanding. We could have composition, the usual semicolon, operator, and then we'll have an if then else con if then else construct and wait, is that a colon or a semicolon? You see the um the, the practice of teaching um, using mental memorizations, which is often the basis of the scientist to to see how much knowledge you retain. And the active knowledge in such a way which give you time and give you all the freedom to choose a topic of interest, give you time to dig out information using your information literacy skills, and allow you time to put things together and so to the different levels of the paper, like a deep understanding and a surface understanding, to see how you can turn the knowledge into something of your own. Now, the last piece is what we call the million dollars question in four minutes. I'm not doing the prayer, but I would like to watch the talk. But the conclusion is, as a teacher, I need to help you to construct the meaning of good teaching and enhanced learning by helping you as a student to behave like a Susan, even though you actually arrive. Okay. So that is the conclusion of the day, and it's also the purpose of the second learning contract, self-regulating learning. Alright, so that's it for today. And if you have questions, you can ask me outside of the classroom, outside of the background. Alright, thank you very much. So that's it for today, CISG 114, Section 1, Web Technology and Life. Until next week, after the holiday, stay in tune.